My name is Mike Haji Michael. Yeah. I'm an associate professor in communications at the University of Nicosia, Department of Communications. I'm also a DJ, poet, a musician, also known as Haji Mike. I've been making music from about 1990 as a solo artist. I used to live in London. Um, I was born in Cyprus. That complicates things, I guess, because I've always felt a desire to come back. Um, and uh, I never felt totally assimilated or welcome in the UK. Um, and I think that's worse now. So I'll, if I did stay, I'd feel much worse mm -hmm. after the Brexit. Yeah. Um, and then I, I um, came back to Cyprus in 93, mainly through my music, because my music became very popular. And um, I ended up staying. And then for a number of years, I worked in media. Uh, TV, radio, newspapers, doing the Haji Mike celebrity thing. But at some point I got very kind of uh, disillusioned with the uh, media, with a couple of exceptions like the Cyprus Mail. Um, but generally I got a bit disillusioned because the media in Cyprus on both sides is very controlled um, by establishments who often are very nationalistic. So I decided that I didn't really want to Aside from the economic factor, which was a big, big issue and still is, um, you can't really have a career in Cyprus on radio, or at that time you couldn't even have a career in TV as a presenter. So I decided to, um, uh, well, I focused more on education really, but I also got into a thing called podcasting. Um, and I was probably the first person, uh, as far as I know, in Cyprus that was podcasting. I did some training workshops at the, what was then uh, UNOPS that later on became uh, Action for Cooperation and Trust Act. And I was very involved in the uh, first phase of the development of CCMC. I was in a position similar to Orestes at one point, I think. Um, I was his predecessor in some ways. Not his predecessor, but pre-pre. Pre -pre. Pre -pre. <laughs> and um, that was an experience that... Uh, uh, although I'd been involved with community media for quite a long time, uh, from the UK mainly, and I knew a lot about it, mainly through radio, because I was on a student radio station when I was at Essex in the 80s. Um, and also we did a lot of other things like, you know, student magazines and, you know, mo mostly kind of like, um, quite a lot of it was sort of like political stuff, you know, leftist political stuff and also anti-racist stuff. And that kind of gave me, we're in a hammam by the way, so we have to have the effect. That kind of gave me um, a lot of um, uh, kind of background in many ways in um, empowering people to engage with media. Um, I went back to radio for a little bit. I worked on Astra, which is um, sort of like alternative station in a way, although it isn't really, in my opinion, because they all play a certain kind of music, whereas other people don't play that music, so it's just another form of establishment musically, with a couple of exceptions. Um, and, but I felt very marginalised on that station, uh, to the point where, you know, the time I was doing was always being reduced, despite the fact there was a lot of people listening, especially from abroad in different countries. And so um, I, I got off that merry-go-round, as we say, the media merry-go-round of Cyprus, and um, started to get more involved with uh, just making a radio show and sending it to people. And I was on about seven stations, different countries. This, was a reg this is a reggae radio show. And um, that went on for a few years, pre-recorded. And then uh, I'd say about three years ago, I was approached by a very good friend of mine called Gibbsy Rhodes, who I've just made an album with. He's based in Corsica, um, to, to engage with it in a live sense. So I, I joined the station called Versionist, initially as just on a guest spot, and then they said to me, you, you know, you've got to play every week. And um, I've been doing that on and off, well, more on, for the last three years. And this is radio from home. Like the, and every two hours, the studio changes. So it's an online radio station, and it's streaming radio, so it's only... Um, it's kind of like very specialised in terms of reggae music. And more recently I started doing a similar kind of thing, but technologically a little bit different because I 
created a stream which is then patched through into a station in London called Greek Beat Radio. And Greek Beat is a community station in London which exists only online. Um, and I play music from the diaspora, you know, from people around the world, basically. Um, and all kinds of music. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, uh, music in Greek or music from Cyprus. It's music like, you know, jazz music or with some sort of connection, either to Cyprus or Greece. Um, mainly because I like that kind of music as well. Aside from all the musical things, which I'm not really going to go into, because I've made a lot of music over the last um, 20 years or so. Um, 27 years, yeah, 27 years. Aside from all that, um, I think the, the thing, mainly during that time I've been a solo artist, but during that time I also set up a bicommunal music label called Olive Tree Music, which was funded by the United Nations at that time around about 2003, 2004, just before the referendum. Um, and uh, we made two albums. One was Poets for Peace, my very good friend Zeki Ali, who's, uh, for me, is the best poet in Cyprus. And um, another album we made was called Cyprus Thing, Volume 1. We didn't get onto Volume 2, <laughs> but it was a collection, really, of 28 songs, different kinds of music from all over Cyprus and beyond. So we had uh, music from Turkey, from Greece, from Norway, that had some sort of Cyprus link. Um, that project was really good, and, uh, and although the company hasn't done much in the last few years, it still exists and we still collaborate. And then there's all the academic stuff, but you, we, we talk more about the academic stuff. You know. Also from your academic experience, yeah. You spoke about media, not just the media as a newspaper and radio and web radio, but also music and art as a medium. So, taking the word media from a video perspective, what constitutes an ethical medium? Well, I think what you've got to look at really is media as text. Media is text. So, when, whenever we talk about media, yeah. the content is a text. And this could be radio, television, it could be Station. newspapers, photography, film, songs, yeah. fashion, art, and so on. Anything creative, mm -hmm. poetry, everything is a text. It's a word. Yeah. Well, not a word. A text could be visual. A text could be a, a film. A text could be a song. And when we're, what we're trying to do with text in the plural is we're trying to understand their story or their meaning. And obviously, we're never going to agree, because sometimes things have got different meanings. As Stuart Hall rightly pointed out, everything is polysemic. So people interpret things differently. However, there is a kind of media, really, that is the dominant ideology in every society. So the dominant ideology in every society is the one that they're trying to tell you what to think. And in telling you what to think, for example, you know, in the UK, the dominant ideology is Brexit. You know, the Tory government has, has suddenly realised there's a lot of political mileage in this because 51% of the people voted for it. It's not exactly a big majority, in my opinion, but there's a dominant ideology that is anti-immigrant, that is very proud of being British, that is very exclusionist. So that dominant ideology kind of permeates throughout various media. So while it's a simplification to say all the media is with the Tory government, if you're a regular listener of the BBC lately, you will see this kind of bias of like 80% of the news is pro-government and you'll only see 20% about the opposition, whether that's Corbyn or the Liberal Democrats or the Greens or the Scottish National Party you see them very marginalised despite the fact that they represent a large proportion of society. So there isn't that kind of fairness with all the different kinds of texts, all the different kinds of media. And this happens in every society. How about Cyprus? Well, Cyprus is interesting because if somebody did, and I, I dare someone to do this, they should read Chomsky and Herman, Manufacturing of Consent, and then apply it to Cyprus. And they'll find throughout Cyprus 
that Chomsky and Herman are absolutely right. Because the media is very controlled by money, by advertising, by politics, by flack, by filtering processes that basically control everything. So when all these things come together, you have a situation where, which is very similar to 2004, where people didn't really know what they were voting for, in my opinion. I don't know anyone who can read the, the Anam plan in, you know, <sighs> one week, <laughs> one week, yeah. yeah. But, the, you know, the ironic thing is the professors were all out there. The ones who voted no, of course, were out there the next day on certain radio programs. Lazaro's Marvelous being the classic one. And they had their books ready. And this is the analysis of the Anam plan. I didn't have a book ready because I hadn't read it, you know. And it's very difficult to read that plan in a week. Most of us read the condensed version and made our decisions. But I think there was a lot of manufacturing of consent at that time. There's a lot of people who were kind of like brainwashed into believing things. Just like people were brainwashed into believing that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. So let's go to war. What is the damage or collateral damage of having a prevalent ideology and a prevalent narrative on the media? I mean, uh, it's very difficult. I mean, I think it's actually very difficult to, to see it in a... I mean, it is a dominant ideology, but I, I think if we assume that everybody agrees because you tell them to agree, then we're actually assuming that the audience have got no opinion. And in assuming that everybody's dumb and they will always vote Trump, we're assuming that, you know, whatever the media tells them, they will agree. And that's never the case. There's always people who disagree. And there's the discerning reader, as Stuart Hall uh, defines various people, or the, the oppositional point of view. So the oppositional point of view is one that basically will always question things, will always be critical of things. And there's also a lot of people who negotiate it, who are somewhere in between. So while the dominant view is a dominant view, usually in most societies, I don't think it's as simple as, you know, that's it. You know, <laughs> whatever they tell us, we're going to do it. Uh, far from it, I think a lot of, in a lot of cases recently, certain dominant views, because there isn't just one dominant view, in elections have been proven completely wrong. Brexit is a good example, and the election of Donald Trump is another example, where most people didn't expect Trump to win. The, the opinion polls didn't expect him to win, and most people didn't expect uh, Britain to leave the European Union. The opposite happened, however. So th th there's different kinds of dominant ideologies, what I'm saying. is Trump's got dominant ideology, he's got an agenda. And I think Clinton, Hillary Clinton had a slightly different one. But basically, it's still the same, for me anyway. They're still very establishment, they're still very, let's go to war with the rest of the world. I don't really see any change in Syria. I don't really see any change in Afghanistan. You know. And uh, you could say the same thing for Cyprus. There hasn't been a change since 1974. I'm going to put the thesis out here. And, uh, don't write it. <laughs> so, uh, the, my question is, is that the, you have the Brexit and you have Donald Trump elected. You said that people didn't foresee, so the media didn't foresee either Brexit was going to happen or Trump was going to elected. So I see an information gap. I mean, first of all, why didn't the media, that the all-knowing media, foreseen that? And why, obviously, that some voices were not heard by the media, they were not heard by the policymakers, mm -hmm. and some information didn't go through. But I can see both ways. Some information didn't go through from the citizens to the media and the analysts to say, hey, what's going on here? This is going to be the outcome. And they were wrong, even marginally, but still they were wrong. And B, uh, how do you see information coming from top to down? I, mean, I think people you said, said were uninformed, so I, they didn't get information. So there is a gap. Well, I think we have to take things separately. Okay. Brexit is one thing, Donald Trump's another thing. I know I've put them together initially. I was just using them as examples of things going, not going as predicted. I think with the Brexit, um, I agree a lot of people were misinformed. I genuinely believe that. Um, but I think also a lot of politicians, especially the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, who in, in some ways may have even done this deliberately, so the Tories could get re-elected, um, totally misunderstood public uh, feeling on the European Union. 
And in misunderstanding public feeling, he underestimated the power of Brexit. Also, there was a complete lack of opposition in a, in a concern. The Labour Party had a very debatable position on Brexit. Jeremy Corbyn had a very debatable position on it. I don't think it was very clear that he was against it. Uh, but I don't think he was very remain either. And I think he took a very sort of ideological leftist stance on the European Union, which I don't really think helped the Remain camp. Now with Trump, we have a completely different thing, really. I remember we had some professors from uh, Kent State University who were visiting on an exchange about a year ago um, for about a week. And we talked a lot about Trump. And the thing that, that one of the professors told me was that the thing is, what, what people can't understand about Trump is that he, he is so outrageous and he's very circus-like. So every single day he's tweeting about it. And every single day everyone's going, blah, 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 you know. And so there's this, he, he built an illusion that he was anti-establishment. I know it's completely ridiculous because there's this billionaire who's funded all the major political parties in the USA claiming to be anti-establishment. I'm not part of the elite. I'm not going to live in the White House, you know. There are a lot of ordinary working class people fall for that kind of thing in the United States. When somebody sits there and says, I'm going to make America great again by creating more jobs, they fall for that kind of thing. Just like when somebody says in Britain, we're going to get all that money back from the EU, we're going to kick out all the immigrants, and we're going to spend it all on the NHS, which is actually a complete lie. Because they're not going to get all that money back from the EU. It's not as simple as that. What's going to happen really is that Britain is going to be paying back money to the EU. So I think that there's a lot of misinformation going on. And with Cyprus, that I don't think there's ever been a time up to 2004 where people actually knew what federation meant. And so we have this p perspective from above, ranging from who's in power. And for a very long time, on this side, it was Deng Tash Senior. On our side, it was different, various people, you know, some not so positive, some much more positive, like Vasilil, for example, who was more in favour of a solution. Um, and I, I don't think anybody ever explained to people what federation means. And they've been fighting over this term since they signed on a little piece of paper in 77 and 79. Magaros Denktash, Kiprianu Denktash, signed these agreements. And ever since then, they've been debating what it means. Now, this sounds, for me, it sounds so pathetic, you know. It's, it's like they can't even agree on what it means, really. And this has been going on since that time. So there's one interpretation, there's another, and then there's another. And then as time goes on, that interpretation changes. The first time I think most people understood what it was about was 2004. But the bogeyman comes into it again, you know the ideology comes into it again, whereby people who had a different kind of opinion on what federation means, in other words, people that were going to vote yes, were treated like, you know, communists were treated in the United States in the 1950s. There was this big purge. There was all these people, um, especially in the Republic of Cyprus, who, who somehow some of these people, fairly prominent politicians, either lost their jobs or resigned. There are several high-profile pro, high cases. And the president at the time, Baba Dobulos, got on TV. Here's the list. These are the, these are the Nenegires. These are the yes people. These are the ones that took all the money from the Americans. And they were trying to indoctrinate people to vote yes. And on that list, somewhere, you'll find my name. And you'll find a lot of other names. You'll even find Lilika's name on that list, too, if you're going to look at the report properly. So this mystical list that he had, which was the um, Marshall Report, I think it was called, or something, Marshall Associates or something, was available to everybody on the internet. The United Nations, as most international donor organizations do, every, uh, periodically, every year, every six months, they have to be accountable. They spend millions, so somebody has to make reports. And these reports always happen. So there's no, there's no rocket science here. This is, not a, this is not a secret report. It's still available on the internet if you want to find it. And there, there, were, there I was sitting there watching the TV, 
on the first time you see the president with a list, and then the next time you see another journalist on antenna, who's sitting there saying, here I am, I'm looking at the, 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 the secret list. And he's scrolling down on the internet. Well, if it's secret, why is it on the internet? You know, it's just like, there's no common sense to it, you know. So there was this atmosphere created for the, for the opinion of a solution, pro-solution, which made, made um, everything, you know, that was in favour of a solution was completely and outrageously rejected. No, things are different. I mean, Most of the media, I mean, there was only, I think there was only two newspapers, Cyprus Mail and uh, uh, Financial Mirror. No, no, Polidis, mm -hmm. on the actual day I'm talking about, yes. Okay. Polidis had different people, we had no people and yes people. It was quite diverse as a newspaper. So my, my Everybody else was in the no camp. The whole media was, you know. I want to ask you something. That was 2004, 2003. Mm. There was no Facebook, so media yeah. was infancy. Yeah. What is the difference now? What is the role of citizens now? Well, the what difference now, now, I mean, I think the difference now is we've all got the illusion that we've got a voice. And I, I think it's an illusion, really. I mean, I think social media is good. You can feel great, you know, I'm posting my picture. But if I put my bubble tossing on there with a flower, I'll get 100 likes. If I say, come down to Legion Street today, there's a protest, I'll get five. You know, Facebook is very trivialised. Unless you're, unless you're working in a group with a few hundred people, you're going to have a dialogue maybe. But if you're just sitting there on your ordinary average wall and you post everything and anything, music, flowers, fashion, what did Trump say today, anything you want, right? And then you put this on there, I don't think many people will, will engage. I don't really think any revolution has happened on Facebook, despite what many people might claim about the Arab Spring or uh, what, what happened in various countries, you know, the Twitter revolution and things. Obviously, it played a role, social media, in the Arab Spring. Music played a role as well, though, you know, especially in, in um, countries where certain songs were deliberately banned, you know, in um, Tunisia, mm -hmm. where the... Where the, the there was a song, I'm trying to remember his name, El General, I think his name is, El General, whose, whose song was actually, the minute he was banned, he wasn't just banned, he was put in prison. And the, that song had a big impact on, uh, especially on youth, because it was a hip hop song in uh, Arabic. So a lot of things play a role. You know, I, th I definitely think Facebook is, you know, social media has changed things. That's definite. But you can't see it one way. You can't say, Social media has changed things because Donald Trump tweets every day. That's changed things as well. You know, he's the first president that's tweet, tweet, twittering, tweeting every day. That must play a role, really, in him getting elected. So I think it can work in different ways. And, and there's just as many nationalistic people, negative people, racist people on social media as there is, uh, you know, people that are challenging all that negativity. So it's a platform for everyone. You know, it's, it's the public sphere, as Habermas, you know, stated it. The public sphere is, isn't necessarily all positive. Can I ask you a question? How come organized groups use social media? It's just a tool. Social media is a tool. But if people get organized, it's not just the tweets, but the hundred people getting organized. How can it contribute, let's say, towards peace journalism com with community media? I think I think it, it can be useful, you know, as an organisational tool. If you want to, uh, well, maybe in some ways, you know, the the coup in Turkey is a bad example when they were using WhatsApp, and the government clamped down on them, you know, and they found out exactly, allegedly anyway. I mean, I think there's a lot of lies going on there as well. But I think you know, a lot of people use it to organise things, and there's nothing really wrong with that. And it can be useful, you know, it's, it's an instant, it's, you know, people see it, you can have visual, you can have sound, you can have uh, video, there's so many different platforms that you can, you can use. But I don't think it's, it's you know, I, I personally I've got a real bone to pick with the terminology. You know, peace journalism, for me, is a very debatable term. 
So I think, first of all, we have to... Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I think, well, does that make everything else? War journalism, I mean, it, there is this kind of... You know, there's right journalism and there's wrong journalism, and really there is just journalism. And there's different kinds of journalism, thematically. You can be a music journalist, you can be a financial journalist, and all these different things. But for me, there's only two, two kinds of journalism. There's good journalism and there's bad journalism. And most people that do bad journalism don't become journalists if they're going to write. So if someone's writing an article that, that creates uh, uh, um, a different kind of perspective, and a very good example of this is um, uh, the bombing of Guernica in Spain. Uh, which is one, it was one of the first places that uh, Blitzkrieg was used by the Nazis and by Mussolini. And at the time there was an American journalist who happened to be there, who wrote about it, I can't remember his name, but it's a very famous, there's been a movie made about it. And having been there a few years ago um, uh, at a conference at the Guernica Peace Museum, um, I found out all the background about this journalist who happened to be there at that time. And when many people say if it wasn't for that journalist being there at that time, then probably that story wouldn't have come out. Because Franco would have shut everybody's mouth up because Franco and, and the Nazis and Mussolini were bombing a lot of villages in, in the Basque country. The only one we found out about was Ganika because there was a journalist there to write about it. Similarly, you know, the famous picture of uh, Phan Thu Kim Phuc in Vietnam you know the photograph of the girl with the napalm running naked down the street? Most people don't know her name, let alone know the name of the photographer. But that um, particular photo, and here I'm going back to the whole idea of text, created a completely different understanding of the war in Vietnam. And it created that understanding primarily with the American public. Now if you want to call that peace photography and give it a label, that's fine, but personally, I just call it photography, I just call it photojournalism. And I think it's important to credit that kind of thing. It's very great to say we're going to teach journalists how to write about peace. I mean, I'd find that a very constructive thing, and I'd also find it very kind of demeaning in some ways to journalists who might have been writing about things from that perspective for quite a long time. Well, I think a lot of journalists are just interested in, in creating copy, and their copy's got to be good. Otherwise, you know, they've just been average journalists. When you get a story that is, shall we say, like, breaking, no one else has got this story, I'm the only one. Uh, I never really experienced this except one time, because um, most of the time when I was writing about journal when I was writing for newspapers, I was writing about music which is a completely different thing, really, unless you're somewhere at some point that something significant happens, like someone died, or you've got the last interview with, you know, Michael Jackson or George Michael or something like that. But when you're a regular journalist, you're always looking for that story that no one else has got. So there was a... a I can't remember the exact year. I mean, Orestes might remember it. Um, do you remember when an aeroplane crashed in a house in Golosin? Yes. There was some from our massive air force of the Republic of Cyprus. Yes, he was just doing some... He was doing some, he was showing off to his girlfriend, his fiancée, like yeah. and it went... It and it crashed. Uh, and it crashed. Yeah. And I thought, oh, Golosin. I was looking on, I was at the barbers, I was looking on TV, and I thought, all oh, right, that's where my friend Chris lives. So I found out Chris, I said, hey, Chris, you see these aeroplanes crashed in your village. I can't talk to you now, right? I'm going to have to call you back. And I said to him, well, call me later on, because it's a really interesting story. And he called me about half an hour later, and he said, the house it crashed on was my neighbor's, but it also uh, destroyed my house. His whole house went like this. It moved around a bit. And his mum was in the house. His mum was about 80, and she was saved by a Filipino woman, because the whole house with the, the fuel from the aeroplane, caught a light. And so I, he said to me, I want to get this story out. And I said, well, I don't really write these kinds of stories. I write about music. <laughs> no, 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 you're the person to write my story. I don't trust anyone else in Cyprus. 
Because when I tell you the truth of this story, you will understand why I want you to write it. I need to find a voice. So I mean, he said that to me. I thought, all right. The next day I went down to Colossi. I've never seen, it felt like I was in a bomb site, you know, like a war zone. Everything was covered in fuel. He, his mother was completely speechless. She couldn't say anything. The Filipino woman was very shaken up. And he told me that he was at the beach going for his morning dip. And he decided, I'm going to go for another one. And in the meantime, he was just thinking, well, maybe I should go back to the studio. He thought, no, I'll go into the sea. And he went into the sea, and that's when the accident happened. So if he had not gone into the sea, he would have been in the house, in the, record, in, sorry about that, in the recording studio. And when I saw the recording studio, I froze. There was a chair like this, you know, a swivel chair, big mixing desk. Everything completely burned, melted, all the buttons burnt, you know, the fuel had gone everywhere. And on his chair sat the hub of a propeller from the aeroplane. When I saw that, I just, <laughs> I was in a complete state of shock. I could never be a full-time journalist covering these sort of stories. You know, and I, went, I went back home, I was completely emotionally drained. And I wrote the story that night. And that story gave him a voice, because I told the story like he was telling the story, with all those details that I've given you, plus a lot more. Uh, for example, they were going to deport the Filipino woman. After, the, uh, after his mother passed away a couple of months later, because I did it as a running commentary, really, uh, they were going to deport instead of giving him a medal for saving his mum's life. Because the old lady had died, she had to get deported, so they deported her. And eventually, I think about two years later, he got compensation from the state. Because they were trying to say, well, it was an accident, and, you know, he didn't mean to do it. And they, want, they actually wanted to make a statue at the bottom of my friend's garden to honour this hero. You know, they didn't do that because of the, the, the resistance by the, the people whose houses were, you know, decimated, basically. And it took about two years for this, you know, to be, two, three years for it to be resolved. Uh, now that to me is what journalism is about, it's about telling someone's story. Whether you call it, what you call it, peace journalism, or whether you call it good journalism, or whatever you give it, whatever title, whatever name, I think it's always about giving people a voice in a, in a situation where, they're not, where they haven't got a voice. So if someone's locked up for their opinion, as a peace activist, your role is to give them a voice as a journalist. But it's not, it's not about um, necessarily taking their side. It's about giving them a voice. I never said, you know, my mate Chris Louvier demands this, you know. This is his story, you know, you can judge it how you want. I would love to ask you something. Yeah. Um, you're a poet as well, and you're an artist, a musician, etc., etc. And uh, the message that perpetuates your work when you use that medium is peace. Yeah. Please talk to us about that, please. Uh, yeah, but I'm not a peace poet. No. <laughs> Nevertheless. I'm a poet know? with a small p. Um, I think. Um, Peace always comes into it for me because I've always, we've always been in a state of war in Cyprus. Even now where we are, you know, if you're going to talk about the buffer zone, the buffer zone is basically an unresolved issue, just as unresolved as North and South Korea, really, because a, a ceasefire has never been declared. So the minute a ceasefire is declared, then everyone's going to say, well, it's the border. So one side is saying, no, that isn't the border. And the other side is saying, yes, it is the border. The party goes on, you know, um, ad infinitum, you know, probably as long as they're wearing those sort of spectacles all the time. So I think, you know, growing up from a very young age and seeing that for myself, seeing soldiers in the village where I was in Marathovona, I grew up um, kind of like with this very clear um, picture of what the world was like. And also through watching things on television when I was a kid. Vietnam War, for example. I do remember seeing that young girl walking up that, that country lane with napalm on her back, you know. 
and uh, understanding those things from quite a young age, from about the age of eight. And that left a lasting impression on me. And then also growing up in the inner city of London, where it was like, you know, at times you did feel like you was in a war zone, you know, especially with um, discrimination from the police, um, aggression from the police, and, and being treated differently. Uh, and I was, I was also a youth worker as well. Uh, when I was doing my PhD in Haringey. So I lived through that time of the Tottenham riots of uh, Broadwater Farm. In a, in a, I wouldn't say a direct sense because I wasn't actually on the, on the farm itself, but I was working in Wood Green. But it was like the whole of Haringey was in curfew and you'd never seen anything like this in Haringey. You know, you can't go out after six o'clock. You know? Young kids getting thrown up against windows by police. It was so Cypriot, you know, um, what are you doing out here, Sonny Jim? You know, this sort of thing. So I think, you know, all of this goes back to voice, really. I mean, as a poet, you've got to find your own voice, but you've also got to give voice. And when you give voice, you find voice. So it's important that you, you're telling those stories. Do you have anything else to say? Did you want to talk about ethics as well? Yes. Ethics. You mentioned that. Yeah, it's not really a subject that I teach, um, but I think it's. Um, I think it's a very important issue in in the context in which we live, um, especially in in the in the sense of fake news, because fake news has become this, or the more academic term is post-truth. I'm not quite sure what that means personally. Post-truth. I much prefer the academic term, fake news. I think academics have this thing about creating terminology that isn't every day. So, you know, fake news, you know. Oh, we can't use fake news, that's in newspapers, you know. Why can't we use fake news? Fake news is fabricated uh, reports, it's, fabri it's lies, basically. Um, and the, the whole concept of post-truth is almost like accepting there's a truth beyond the truth. I don't accept it as truth, I accept it as lies. So I shouldn't be using the word truth. Maybe it's a philosophical point of view, I'm not sure, but I much prefer the term fake news. I think really it's the biggest challenge that the media's ever had. Because you never know, if, if I, you know, five years ago decided to say, you know, the president shot his dog, I would have been sued, you know. But Facebook was covered in it when the president's dog died, you know. The, the driver ran over the dog deliberately, someone poisoned the dog. These really trivial stories, all of which are probably lies. You know, the dog probably just passed away, I don't know. Don't, who knows the truth about the president's dog, I don't know. <laughs> but I'll just give you an example right, where everybody fabricates things. Um, and we've even got fake news sites in Cyprus. Now, the, the thing is, there, there is an ethical thing going on, really, that no one's really been talking about, because like I said, if I said that five years ago, a president, I would have been sued, right? Uh, no, one, no one got sued on Facebook for some of the lies they were saying about the president. And basically, um, no, one, no one even thinks it's a question of ethics. Because we've got into this mindset now where fake news is acceptable. It's, you know, part of life. George Michael is a good example, you know, when he passed away, there was all these things, but he's a drug addict, his boyfriend left him, his this and that, you know. I actually did a content analysis of a Sun newspaper report. There was 20 lies in, in the space of one reportage. And none of these lies came true, because they were blatant lies. You know, they were, they were, even though the coroner's report stated clearly, George Michael didn't die from any complications, they were still arguing that he did. So telling lies is something, manipulating is another thing. Right? Well, I think this is the interesting point because telling lies, fake news, fabrications, manipulating, they're all interrelated. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's a lot of aspects of the Cyprus problem that are contentious. Mm -hmm. The four freedoms of the Turkish nationals in Cyprus. Some people say this was agreed from 2004 by uh, Babadopoulos, apparently. Right? 
Anastasiadis says, no, of course it wasn't agreed, you know. We would never agree to this, you know. Is this being put out there to slow down the process? I don't know. I'm not sure. I think the best way we should know how these things go is the talk should be televised. So we all see exactly what goes on. I know it's going to be very boring and most people won't sit and watch it. But I'd love to watch what goes on in those rooms. Because there's never any truth that is objective. One person comes out and says this, another person comes out and says that. For a honeymoon period between um, Akinji and Anastasia, these everybody thought we're going towards a solution. And then all the, the bombardment starts on Facebook, you know. Anastasia, this is a traitor. He's worked it out with the Americans. He's sold Cyprus. He, he even went to Turkey and had a secret meeting. These are, these are articles on Facebook from news sites or from individuals who are, who are writing them as Facebook comments. And there's people underneath believing these things. Engaging, disagreeing, whatever. So I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different aspects to the same thing, basically. A lie is a lie. A fake is a fake. Uh, manipulation is manipulation. But some people do it in a more sophisticated way. You know, a lot of Greek Cypriot politicians say, not one single settler can stay in Cyprus. And this is in the United Nations uh, resolution, according to them, right? Passed in the 1970s or 1980s. I'm not sure which one it was. There's been so many. So this is, this is truth. One side's truth. You get the other point of view, which says, well, but you agreed to something different in 2004. And you agree to certain exceptions. We didn't agree to this. But who, who agreed to this? You know. So there's there's so much uh, areas of grayness in terms of what is, you know, true, what is false, what is mm -hmm. fact, what is fiction. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest to a normal citizen, a normal citizen, to find the truth, to find the it's very difficult to answer that question because I don't know, uh, half the time I don't know what's going on because all of these decisions are made on my behalf, your behalf, his behalf, behind closed doors. So we're never really going to know what the truth was at that point. And I've got very little faith in politicians, whoever they may be. How so about transparency and access to information? That's very important. That's definitely very important. But would you be given that transparency? I doubt it very much. We've got people killed from the 1950s during the Olga time for being traitors, in inverted commas. Whole villages saw them being killed, Greek Cypriots, by Greek Cypriots. Everyone knows what happened, but no one's ever been pardoned or no one's ever been compensated. Or no one's ever had the, the guts to sit there and say, this was a murder. In a time of crisis, when things can go wrong, fair enough. That's, that's uh, one explanation. But if we can't find those truths, and we can't find the truth from the 60s of the violence, and we can't find the truth in the 70s, and so on and so on, then we, one, one thing that's definitely needed in Cyprus is a very objective reconciliation uh, process, which needs to take into account all of these murders. I would love to know who, who killed Gavazoglu and Mishaulis. And those people, you know, just these people actually did it. But every year we have to go there and we do, you know, we do the same thing every year. I don't go anymore. I used to go. But at some point I think, but why, why hasn't the truth ever come out about this? And the truth is there for people to find, to analyze in history books, facts, reports. Different people say different things. I read things that certain people post that made my hair stand on the end about that. But those voices usually, they're silenced, you know. No, 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 it's not like that. It's like this. They were killed by TMT. All right, great. Well, where's, where's the justice though? Where's the justice for, the, for those families? And, uh, and that goes ac right across the board. And I, I think really that, that that's really needed in Cyprus. If we're going to move forward properly, we need to dispel all, all of these sort of things. Uh, and a lot of these, these things go a very uh, deep-seated, deep the, the mistrust that exists, not just between the communities, but within the communities. 
between left and right. And usually the right was doing the killing on both sides. That's got to be, you know, and, and this can start really with the most recent example, which was the killing of Solomon and Isaac, which happened live on television. And you see the guy going bang, bang. You know, that person's never been tried. I mean, if we're going to have real solution, you know, we can't keep going backwards. The Enos's vote is going backwards. It's, in my opinion, something like that is retarded. It's a retarded move going back to the 1950s in a, in a referendum that was held under the auspices of the church. So it wasn't even a democratic process, really, you know, in, as an election as such, in an atmosphere in which people were probably terrorized into voting that way without even thinking about it. Because if you look at it on paper, you know, much in the same way if you look at it on paper today, why would anyone want to unite with Greece today? I mean, economically speaking, I think it's suicide for Cyprus, you know. But w we never think clearly about these things. We never think, you know. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Can we conclude and wrap up? Yeah. Yes. Is there something That's why I wanted to, to warn because I, I would like to have you, like, uh, if you have anything to add. That's, that's why I wanted to just continue. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the only, the only way you can do something different is to do it yourself. Um, and that applies to all media. And that's increasingly happened. Cause we're living in a in an age where the internet can connect us and we can be as creative as we want to be. Um, that creativity is, a, is a, like a spark that, that can trigger other things. And, you know, making things happen in that way, as, uh, Dave, as um, David Gauntlet says, making is connecting. And it's a point of view that I, I like a lot. But in the context of Cyprus, making is also resisting. And if we don't change the status quo, uh, the status quo stays the same. So it's, it is really time to change things rather than just sit back and be told this is the next plan, vote against it, you know. Or it, well, the talks, you know, they crashed, they ended, you know, there's a deadlock. One side's going to blame the other and the other. People in the meantime have to get on the street. It's something that we haven't really done. But to do it dynamically, not, not the way it's done, in you know the football stadium in Lidra Palace, and it's the same old poets, and it's the same old songs, and all the same old crap basically. Do something much more dynamic than that. Even like what my friends done <laughs> in a very small way, brick by brick, is a different kind of thing. You know, you want to take the wall down, you take it down by each brick if you can. It's a very difficult thing to do, as you know. But you know, I think something like that is more radical, and and occupy in Cyprus was more radical than 40 years anything that happened before it. However, for that to work, it has to be a mass movement. It can't be 200 people. And that's the problem. How do you get that mass movement? That's a question. And that's what should have happened from 74.